Hey y'all, so continuing on with some vent talks. In this video, I'm gonna talk about when it's time to intubate. This is a heavy topic and, okay, full disclosure, I am neither a pulmonologist nor a physician of any sort. I am not an RT. I am just a nurse practitioner who has spent a lot of time in an ICU and this is, this is my perception of how to make that assessment. When you're a new, especially a new provider, it's really hard to figure that out and your attending's gonna say, is it time? In this video, we're gonna talk about reasons why we intubate, when BiPAP alone will do, some COVID specific information, and at the very end, I'm gonna give you the puzzle pieces you need to have in place to help you make this decision quickly. So if we haven't met yet, my name's Bree, I'm a nurse practitioner, I make content for nurses, NPs, and students. Welcome. <music> Okay, when to intubate. Um, so really it boils down to two problems. The patient is having failure to oxygenate or failure to ventilate. And then there are a whole host of problems that fall under each of those categories. A main piece of your decision making is gonna be figuring out what the problem is and that's gonna tell you whether or not this is something you can turn around quickly, whether this is something you could use BiPAP for in the short run, or is this something that's gonna take a while so you need to go ahead and just do it. Reasons why people fail to oxygenate. Well, probably the most common thing you're gonna see in the ICU is a mismatch of the oxygen supply and demand related to septic shock. That's our bread and butter, particularly in the MICU, septic shock. That's what you're gonna see. High demand for oxygenation based on the sepsis itself. Now, other types of shock can do this as well. Cardiogenic, hypovolemic, any kind of shock where you have poor perfusion, you need more oxygen. You need more energy, the body's using it more energy, so you need to supply it more. In particular, with septic shock, you're gonna develop a metabolic acidosis. So then your patient's gonna be doing this Kussmaul's breathing, they're gonna be deep, breathing deep and heavy and fast, and you're gonna to need to know Winter's formula like the back of your hand. You should just have it memorized. If your patient has a metabolic acidosis, you have a serum from the lab, bicarb level of like four or five, you need to be able to very quickly figure out via Winter's formula, which is one and a half times your serum bicarb plus eight, how much they need to breathe to compensate for that metabolic acidosis. And if they're not doing that well enough, it's time to tube. So no Winter's formula like the back of your hand. You should be able to very quickly calculate this in your brain when someone hands you a gas. You need a serum bicarb and you need a blood gas to tell you what their PCO2 actually is. Definitely spend some time researching metabolic acidosis and Winter's formula. And in the last video that I did where I talk about ventilator pearls and takeaways, I discuss it in a little bit more depth if you want some more. The other thing with that Kussmaul's is that the work of breathing in and of itself requires a huge amount of oxygen supply. So it uses up a ton of the cardiac output that you're getting so you can have worsening shock. So it's sort of a vicious cycle that you have to interrupt with intubation. The other thing you're gonna commonly see that causes a problem with oxygenation is just an inherent lung problem. Things that can do this are collapse of the lung from a pneumothorax or atelectasis, any type of filling process like pneumonia, interstitial edema, fibrosis can do it, a pulmonary edema can do it. Blood in the airways, like diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, that can do it. And then there's any kind of vascular problem like PE or even COVID with the microthrombi where you get dead space, you're ventilating but you can't oxygenate. Um, that will lead to hypoxia. Those are all pretty straightforward problems. Your failure to oxygenate, those are reasons why you intubate. I'm gonna talk to you in a little bit about COVID specific stuff and how you know when to intubate those patients. Conversely, there's a problem of failure to ventilate and there are a whole host of things that can do this. And this is a little bit more tricky because this can be an acute problem or a chronic problem. And when it's a chronic problem, you have to go back to quality of life and is this the kind of person who would wanna live on a ventilator? So let me go through some of those kind of things. So first, you have an issue with airway protection. For example, elective procedures where you have to sedate someone, an EGD, a TEE, something like that. If you're gonna to have to sedate them heavily, they're not gonna be able to protect their airway, you're gonna to have to intubate them for that. There's anatomical problems with airway protection like skin and soft tissue infections, Ludwig's angina, angioedema, malignancies, trauma. Any of these things can cause a failure to ventilate, require intubation. The second piece is your neuro problem. So if your brain is not telling your lungs to breathe, you have a failure to ventilate. Multiple things can cause this. Let's run through some of them. Agitation, probably the number one thing. And the reason is not the agitation in and of itself. 
It's the necessity of giving them sedation in order to control the agitation to keep them safe that is the problem. And one solution that I offer to this is to put an end title in their nose and monitor that kind of like you would treat someone that you're giving conscious sedation to. Anything that reduces their GCS, poor GCS. So that old saying, less than eight must intubate. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's just sort of a guideline. If their GCS is getting to that level of impairment, you need to consider intubation and things that can cause that. Any kind of head injury, TBI, stroke, seizures, all of these things can reduce your GCS. Apnea, aspiration, over sedation, Number three, failure to ventilate, ye old COPD, which you will get to know very well if you work in a MICU. Lots and lots and lots of acute exacerbation of COPD. These notes you can write in your sleep. There's also asthma, but you know, there you go. Lastly, you have neuromuscular disease. Now this is where things get a little tricky. Examples would be like myasthenic crisis, ALS, um, burn injuries, restrictive lung um, chest wall problems. Um, here's the thing. Okay, let's take for example the person with ALS. Um, this is a chronic, progressive, debilitating illness, but plenty of people live very good lives and have high quality of life while requiring um, chronic long-term ventilator support. The patient who is awake and interactive with their environment, but just has a lack of ability to control their diaphragm and their breathing. Another example would be someone who's had like a, a C-spine injury, but neurologically they're intact. If they're the kind of person who is gonna have some quality of life with that, yeah, put the, put the breathing tube in and let them live with that. Trach them, let that be. That's not something you're gonna correct. That's a chronic problem. And that's a little bit different than some of these other issues that we've talked about where you're going to intubate while you fix the underlying problem. So when I'm making a decision about whether or not to intubate or not, I take in mind what, what of those causes, the failure to oxygenate, failure to ventilate, and what the specific problem is, whether or not that's something that will quickly turn around, something I can turn around within 24 hours, or whether or not that's something that's going to linger for a while, whether or not it's something that's going to need treatment for a while. For example, the patient who has pneumonia, that's not gonna turn around quickly. You need time to diagnose what the species is. You need time to get the right antibiotic on board. You need time for the lungs to respond to that. If you pull up an x-ray of someone who's got profound bilateral infiltrates, white all the way up, or even part of the way up, and their oxygenation is poor, um, that's someone just go ahead and tube them because putting them on BiPAP is not gonna gain you anything. BiPAP, okay, what responds well to BiPAP? Glad you asked. Fluid overload. So the patient in heart failure that needs aggressive diuresis, it will give them a little bit of positive pressure to help open up that heart a little bit while you can get the fluid off. And if you can get that off quickly, you may be able to turn them around. Some drug overdoses, you know, some of these people, I so I was a new nurse in the era of GHB, scoop. Anybody remember that? Early 2000s, I was an ER nurse at Grady. Everybody was taking this scoop. And GHB, when you take that, um, it depresses your respiratory drive enough that you have to get intubated, but it wears off like that. And let me tell you, these it, it tended to be like a lot of bodybuilder type dudes, big dudes, you know? They get intubated, they're on the vent, they wake up within six hours and they rip that sucker out every time they self-extubated. That's something that can turn around pretty quickly you have to gauge in the interim whether or not they're ventilating enough and whether or not BiPAP um, will be enough support or are they gonna go apneic on you. If it's an overdose of an opioid, you can give some Narcan, something like that where you have a plan in place to kind of quickly act on it. This is somebody I might watch for a little bit, but I'm gonna watch them like a hawk. Atelectasis is another one. So somebody who say had surgery and they've just not been using their IS, they've not been moving around in the bed very well, sticking BiPAP on applies some positive pressure and you can kind of blow open that lung enough that you can turn them around. So it's reasonable to give them a trial of BiPAP and see how they do. Something that's not likely to turn around quickly would be like your pneumonia, your fibrosis, your COVID, a direct contraindication to BiPAP is gonna be somebody who's vomiting. So your GI bleeder, don't put them on BiPAP. 
your patient who has MRSA pneumonia, MRSA pneumonia produces some nasty, copious, thick secretions. Don't put them on BiPAP, they'll aspirate. Um, they also can't cough against that positive pressure, so a person like that is not a good idea for BiPAP. Um, pneumonia in general just doesn't really respond to BiPAP. So if you pull up your chest x-ray and you've got bilateral infiltrates and they're hypoxic and they have pneumonia, just go ahead and tube them. Okay, let's talk about the COVID patient for a minute. We all know by now about the happy hypoxemic. These people are breathing okay. They're tachypnic, but if you ask them if they're having trouble breathing, they all, what do they say to you? They say the same thing to everybody. Like, no, I'm fine, until they're not fine, and then they'll tell you. But most of them are gonna say, yeah, I'm fine. And they're breathing like 35 times a minute. You're like, really? And you look at this x-ray and you have bilateral ground glass infiltrates all the way up, and you're like, really? These folks are tolerating SpO2 is on the monitor of 88, 87, you get a gas, it's really poor, and they still look okay. There's always that debate in your mind of, okay, clinically this person looks okay, but on paper they look awful. When do I bite the bullet and put the tube in? Okay, COVID is 180 degrees the opposite of everything else we've ever learned in pulmonary physiology and ARDS. It's over here, that's over there. <laughs> This kind of patient on paper, if they had traditional ARDS from cap pneumonia, they'd be tubed for sure. They're decompensating and they're in the hurt locker. They need to be tubed. The patient with COVID, they could tolerate this for a lot longer. And I know that probably where you all are practicing your shop is similar. The tides have turned. Initially, we were tubing these people early. Now we're finding that if the virus is that severe, that they are requiring intubation, that they don't generally come back. So in my mind, they're tolerating it okay. Let them tolerate it as long as humanly possible because once I put that breathing tube in, they stop interacting with their environment. They're not interacting with me. They're not interacting with their family. And that may be it. It's very likely it. And then we're just gonna have to make some hard decisions down the road about when to take the tube out. So for me, I look at these people, if they're on BiPAP and they're working hard, or if they're not on BiPAP and they're working hard and they're still hypoxic and they can't answer me in more than one word responses and they say they're tired, it's time. But, but here's the caveat. For me, this is just how I practice. Before I put that tube in, I call that family, I FaceTime them, I put them in front of them and I say, look, here we are in life we're gonna put this breathing tube in. If he wants it, this is not going to fix anything. It's gonna buy him some time to see if his lungs will fix themselves. I highly suggest if this is what you wanna do, you put a stop date on this. We're gonna do this for a week, 10 days, whatever. If we're not better, we're gonna turn it off. And I try, these people are scared. And so it's, it's so, oh, it's heartbreaking to have these discussions. I know you all know, you don't need me to tell you this, but I think it's really important that you do. Because once you go down this route, you're gonna tube them, you're probably gonna right away prone them and paralyze them. And there's just not many that are coming back from that. So my threshold to intubate these people is way up here. So when I'm making a decision about the COVID patient, I look at them clinically, like I just described. I look at the x-ray, has it changed at all? How bad is it? I'll look at their COVID markers, cause it does kind of tell me like if the markers are all going up, that they're probably getting worse. How long have they been on steroids for? Medication-wise, there's just not much else to do for it. Sometimes I'll go up on their anticoagulation because they may have microthrombi and or PE. If this patient is becoming obtunded, it's time. But tachypnea and hypoxia in and of themselves are not reason to intubate these people, in my mind. Do you need an ABG? Okay, the, you don't, all right, you, you don't. Um, this is going to vary a little bit based on which attending you're working with and your comfort level, but what I want you to understand is an ABG is just one piece of a puzzle. It does not tell you the whole picture. You can look at the monitor and see what their SpO2 is. You got a good waveform. It's going to correlate to what your PO2 is based on your oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. So you don't necessarily need an ABG to tell you a patient's hypoxic. You do need an ABG to tell you if they're hypercarbic or acidotic. So the down and dirty, what diagnostics do you need to help you make this decision? Well, number one is no diagnostic. It is just your brain. You look at the patient. How do they look? 
How are they breathing? What is the pattern of their breathing? How fast are they breathing? What is the SpO2 on the monitor? Are they able to talk to you in sentences or is it a one word answer? Are they tripoding? What is their respiratory pattern? Do they have respiratory alt alternans where things are going in and out in the wrong pattern? What are their lung sounds? Are they wheezing? Are they wet? Are they full of ronchi? All of these things tell you the most about when it's time to intubate your patient. Your asthmatic who's breathing too fast, they need to be tubed. So correlating the clinical picture, what you see with what your diagnosis is, tells you more than anything else. But on top of that, here are the pieces of data that I like to get. If I had perfect world and I had every piece of data out there, this is what I would get. ABG, chest x-ray, CT chest, possibly CTA pulmonary protocol, correct eyes and nose, and weights. What are their weight doing? For eyes and nose, I'll look more at their weight. Has their weight gone up, gone down, stayed the same? How, how high or low are they? And do they have pedal edema? Do they have JVD? You know, all of those kind of things tell me more about volume status, but volume status in and of itself is important. So those are the things that you would look at. Clinical indicators being top, and then those other things. And then you piece it all together, like, my clinical indicators for, um, I don't know, let's say volume overload, pulmonary edema. So the patient is hypoxic. They're working hard to breathe. I can hear crackles. They have pedal edema and JVD. Um, and my x-ray, I see pleural effusions plus a lot of vascular congestion. This is the person I'm going to give a crap load of Lasix to right now. Well, assuming the renal function is okay, I'm going to give a bunch of diuretics to very, very quickly, put a Foley in, watch the eyes and nose specifically really closely for the next hour or two, probably put them on BiPAP. And if they don't turn around quickly, I'm going to tube them. So I look at the specific pieces of the assessment that correlate to the most likely diagnosis that I have. So the first thing is figuring out what you think the problem is. And the second thing is what diagnostics, what assessment pieces directly tell you how they are compensating for this. And check out that other video I made about ventilator takeaways. 